Okay, I, this is Louise Chiquette. I'm a bilingual health promotion consultant for the Best Start Resource Center of Health Nexus. Welcome to the webinar on strategies to engage families in prenatal education. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous people who've been living and working on the lands across Canada for thousands of years, including the land where you're watching this webinar from today. The Health Nexus office in Toronto is located on the historical territory of the Wendat, Petun, Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of New Credit First Nations. We're grateful to have the opportunity to work in this territory. So as you will have noticed, you are all muted and hopefully you're, um, you can all hear me at this point. I know there was a portion where there was no, no sound available, but hopefully everybody's back now. And uh, you can chat using the chat line, uh, the chat box on the right-hand side, and that will stay for the duration. You can also download some files. And I've put a couple of files there of a previous webinar on activities for prenatal education that are face-to-face -face activities. And uh, there's 14 activities that can be used. They're not directly related to the webinar today, but I still thought it would be good to have those files in. Those uh, activities have already been integrated into the prenatal education modules. And you also see a box with web links. Now, I always find it interesting to uh, get an idea of who's online. To, uh, so if you could uh, fill up this, uh, this poll to indicate what of the following best represent the workplace for which you provide prenatal education. We seem to have a majority of people from public health unit in different types of program. And that, that we do have a registration list, but it still helps the presenters know who's in the room, who actually attended the, is attending the webinar. And also for other participants, it gives them an idea of who's online. So thank you very much for filling that out. And uh, I also now want to give you a, an idea in case you're not familiar with the, uh, the, the prenatal education. Key messages, we will be referring to them regularly. So this is a, a website that was created to make sure that everyone who provides information to pregnant couples, women, would give the same information. And those key messages have been, uh, uh, they're all based on, on evidence. They were reviewed by a lot of people. So there are 25 topics. And if I pick um, any of them, actually I'll pick healthy weight, healthy eating and weight gain as an example. And my internet is just a little bit slow, but there we go. Hopefully you can still all see that. So we have the first tab at the top gives the key messages. Those would be the messages you want to give to pregnant people. And, and those will be referred to by the presenters today, as a matter of fact. And I apologize, but the new food guide came out last week. We have not yet updated the key messages, but we are well aware that there will be some adjustments that will have to be made, but it involves a lot of key messages, so we want to be uh, systematic and do it all at once. But there are a few uh, key messages are here, and you have supporting evidence. Why are we saying that? And for each one, there's lots of information that's available. And then the resources and the links that you, for yourself or for uh, the people you work with, resources for clients, and resources for professionals, depending on their key messages, and uh, all the references that are mentioned in the supporting evidence are all there. And we do try to keep keep all that up to date, and I think there's 1,240 links for French and for English, so it, it's a little bit of a challenge to keep it all up to date, but I try hard to do that. And uh, you can uh, also register for updates so that when there are major updates that are done, you will get an email to indicate what has been changed. And uh, this gives you a little bit of information as to how these were developed and uh, all the people that were involved in developing this, this tool. So I've we'll, got to keep going. It keeps on going here. So a little bit more. Don't want to forget anybody here. It's like the credits on the... On a, at a, for a movie. 
And, uh, and then if you just want the key messages, we've developed the tab just for that, and you could just click on that and then print, print it, and you could hand it to, uh, to uh, people in your prenatal classes. So today we'll be referring a little bit more to the healthy weight, healthy eating and weight gain and the breastfeeding key messages. And uh, breastfeeding would be, uh, I'll go back to the home tab, you can reach them anywhere, but breastfeeding because it comes a little later in the process of the whole prenatal, it, it's at the bottom. Those are more related to once the baby is born. So hopefully that all makes sense. So now I'm glad to introduce our speakers. We have two staff from Toronto Public Health to present for us today. Jenny Adario is a registered dietitian and Patricia Alder is a registered nurse. Both have years of experience facilitating groups for families and caregivers in the city of Toronto. And I will uh, give the microphone to Jenny and Trish. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thanks, Louise. Um, we wanted to say hello and welcome. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so thank you for allowing us today. Um, happy January 31st. Uh, we thought we'd bring some sunshine um, and maybe some warmth <laughs> today. Uh, here in Toronto, it's quite cold. I'm not sure what it's like uh, where everyone is today. Uh, so we thought we'd bring some sun. So I'm just going to introduce myself. Um, my name is Jenny. I'm a registered dietitian here at Toronto Public Health. I've worked here for about 15 years. Um, I began my public health career um, in Kingston as an intern at the KFLNA Health Unit. Um, and although here at Toronto Public Health I started in healthy living, I have spent um, the majority of my years uh, working with expectant families as the healthiest babies possible dietitian and also running CPMP programs. Um, I have also a background and interest in communications and journalism and worked in a dedicated role here to um, create and develop the uh, Pregnancy to Parenting blog. Um, and more recently, in the last couple of years, I've had a dedicated and working in uh, Canada Premium. So um, I'm also going to introduce you to my colleague, Trish. Okay, thank you, Jenny. So I'm really happy to be here with you as well today. And in my current role right now in Toronto Public Health, I'm a health promotion specialist in early years, focusing in training and development. And I've been in Toronto Public Health actually for over 28 years. And most of my career, I've been involved in group facilitation. I've worked with many different age group populations. And for the last 20 years, I've been focusing with training, mentoring, and coaching. And this is both internal staff in Toronto Public Health, as well as our community partners Ontario-wide. I'm a master trainer for Nobody's Perfect um, with national accreditation. So this helps me in terms of having extensive experience with facilitation. And more recently, I've been focusing on creating um, modules here for staff and workshops around facilitation skills development and uh, advanced practice facilitation. So we're going to share um, today some engagement strategies um, to support the work you're doing with prenatal families in your community. Um, we know that in your community, much like here in Toronto, there are vulnerable populations um, that you're working with. And our hope is that um, you'll see how the strategies that we talked about today are transferable among any population. Um, so you as a facilitator have a really important role to play in group engagement. Uh, so today we're going to focus on where you can make a real difference. We're hoping that we can hear from you, so we're hoping that you'll chat with us through the chat feature um, and that you'll actually walk away with some tools you can take and apply to your practice. Absolutely. So to get a little bit of an idea of how you think of yourself in terms of a prenatal educator, we have some questions for you to be thinking about. So we're going to pull up a poll. And um, so from your perspective, there is a pull button on your screen and thinking about these questions. In your prenatal education session, A, I feel I have to answer every question I'm asked during a session. Or B, I feel I need to follow my session plan as written. 
Or C, I feel I am responsible for participants not returning. Or D, I feel as the educator I have the better answer. Or perhaps it's E, none of the above. So thank you for answering that question. And we can see a great many of you did take the time to answer, so that's great. We have a variety of responses still coming in. Um, let's see, what kind of statistics we have? Okay, so a majority of you are falling and none of the above. Okay, wonderful. Um, some of you picked A and some of you have also picked B and C. Okay, quite a few answers coming in. So we're going to ask you to reflect on these questions throughout the webinar. And at the end, we're going to actually be revisiting them again. So the slide in front of you now has a word which some of you may or may not be familiar with. So the word facilitator. To speak to our role as prenatal educators, we're going to ask you to consider this term facilitator. It's a word that's often used when we hear about groups, and the term facilitator is used rather than the word teacher. Some of you may be wondering, what's the difference or are the terms interchangeable? So we'd like to ask you to help us define what is a facilitator. So we do have the dictionary meaning, um, basically, as a facilitator, a person or thing that makes an action or process easier, easier. And a true educator acts as a facilitator of learning. So if you can add to this, please share with the group what else you see a facilitator to be. And you can type your answers in for the whole group to read. Okay. Does anybody want to add anything? Okay. Maybe we could give uh, you guys a minute to so we can see your answers. It looks like many of you are typing, so we'll just give you a, a minute to answer for us. Great. So we have making the group feel comfortable, learning and sharing from each other. Wonderful. Absolutely. Okay. Relaying messages to ensure group understands. Great ideas, helping all participants feel safe, supported, drawing on expertise from the audience. Hmm, a guide through unfamiliar territory. Great ideas coming in. Mediator, collaboration. Wow, I can see we're all thinking along the same lines. Very, very good point. So in addition, to what you've listed, uh, we'd like you to consider and think about this as we deliver today's webinar. In my experience over the years, I've come to see facilitation as a large part of a relationship with the families that we work with. And in this relationship, it holds some basic values around respect and treating our clients as equals. And I've also found that we are as much learners in the process as we are educators. I see us as supporters, as some of you did already mention in your chat, helping parents to recognize their ability and strengths and capacity, and to encourage decision making. As facilitators, we're also often in the role of bringing people together. And many of the parents that are attending may be isolated for one reason or another. As facilitators, we can often be in a role to help them build new connections with other parents. And we know connecting is actually a vital role because our prenatal clients may be experiencing the social isolation, and this is a contributing factor to many health concerns, as we know, like postpartum depression. So sometimes even the simple act of building a connection among our prenatal clients in our sessions can make such a huge difference in their lives. So to have a little bit more context on how to facilitate, we need to know who, are, who is the population we're working with. So Jenny is going to talk to you a little bit more about who are the participants and what are their needs. OK, thank you, Trish. Um, so from my experiences working in prenatal education here in Toronto, I know that our participants are incredibly diverse. 
which means that their needs are equally diverse. Um, our participants, for example, may have difficulty finding resources. So they may want to attend other programs or classes or services, but they really can't afford the upfront costs or the transportation expenses or childcare expenses associated with those services. Um, our participants may not have the education or level of literacy to access, read, and find most of the material, whether it's printed or online, and then really apply that information to their decisions or their behaviors. Many of our participants are isolated. Um, they may not know who to talk to about their prenatal or preconception questions. They are afraid that they'll be judged or labeled as bad parents if they come forward to ask for help or additional support. I think this is really true of clients who have histories of substance abuse or misuse or um, have any sort of involvement or history of involvement with Child Protective Services. So many of these clients are very reluctant to disclose any information for fear of being found out that they're doing the wrong thing when really at the end of the day they're trying to do the right thing. That's why they're at your education session. So many may be young and feel judged about being too young and not having the life skills needed to be a parent or judged on lifestyle choices as a young person. I know here in Toronto, many of our programs, much of our participants are newcomers. So they're new immigrants who may be looking for information that's culturally relevant in their language. Um, also true for many of our indigenous populations, really looking to match um, our, the advice that we're giving them with what they believe and what they value. A new one that we're seeing a lot more often with our participants are cross-cultural parenting. They have questions about how to parent when them and their partner or spouse um, come from different cultural backgrounds. So they're looking to find some middle ground related to cultural tradition, practice, and belief. Um, they're looking to adapt to new values and trying to create new experiences and traditions for their families. Um, we also know that participants have lived experience and could come to program with trauma or traumatic experience. Overall, they may be looking to find community and commonality with other parents or caregivers. Are there any other participants I've missed that you see coming to your group? Um, so you can let me know. You can type in the box, in our chat box. Um, and I'll share them with the group if you feel comfortable. Did I cover everything? <laughs> um, I will say too, um, at the program, like I'm, I run a CPMP program here in Toronto, um, we also have many different families who attend our program. Um, so we have pregnant individuals who come with their partners, um, but they may come with a grandparent or a friend. Um, sometimes older children come with their um, parents, um, really initially just to support with language. Um, we do offer interpretation services at many of our programs, but they bring a child who can help with that. So what we want you to be aware of is that each of these supports that come with your participants at programs, they, they're highly influential in how the participant receives messages and engages with the group. Um, so it's really important to also think about that family dynamic. So ultimately, when we look at all these different participants, um, so Leanne here is also saying I miss uh, around same 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 sex couples um, and blended families. Absolutely. Um, so ultimately, no matter who our participants are, generally they're adult learners. So we're going to talk more about that today. Um, something else to think about as we move through this webinar: family life looks much different now in Canada than it did 50 or even 20 years ago. Parents are managing very complicated issues compared to generations past. Even though we may be able to connect in more ways, now using technology, our human connections, so to extended family, to friends, have really declined. So with the changes in technology, information becomes out of date really fast, and parents are really looking for our help to navigate the prenatal and parenting information more so, so now than ever. So um, we have a, another poll, another question for you here around adult learners. So if you can um, answer what you think is your best answer. So adult learners, A, have a variety of learning styles. B, learn best when content is relevant to them so that they can apply it immediately. 
C, have existing knowledge, skills, and strengths, or D, all of the above. Okay, so it looks like most of you right now are answering um, either A or D. Um, and D is um, the answer we were looking for, but any of the answers really are correct. So if you answered any from A through D, um, those are all the answers we're looking for. So we're going to talk more about each of those now in more detail. Okay, thanks, Jenny. So let's look at the first one where we're saying that adult learners have a variety of learning styles. So when we are thinking about our prenatal education, why would we need to have a variety of learning styles in our session? I'm just going to give you a little bit of background about this and thinking about ourselves as adult learners are even in our experience, many of us have been away from formal schooling for many years, and so have our participants. And also, what kind of experiences did we have with school? Some of us may not have had the best experiences, and we may be holding on to some of those when we're thinking about getting information and accessing information and learning information. There are a variety of learning styles. And one of the interesting things around learning styles is that we all have a preferred learning style. And as educators, when we have a preferred learning style, we may also tend to use this preferred method in the delivery of our own work. And a lot of research has been done on learning styles. There are many more than the three common styles that you often hear about. So the ones that are often talked about are the visual, the auditory, and the kinesthetic. Visual being those that learn best with seeing it, so you may prefer to have diagrams, uh, you may prefer to read, you may prefer to have pictures, or the auditory. Those are the people that learn best by hearing, and of course the kinesthetic, where you have the ability to experience and practice, so learning best by doing. So I'm going to talk to you about a few other learning styles you may not be as familiar with. So. This could include the sequential learner. A sequential learner really likes to learn step by step. And if you give to the steps getting too far ahead, a sequential learner will not be able to get there until they've had the previous step. So if you have sequential learners in your group, they may need to be getting information in a very concise and predictable manner. And then there's the global learner who likes to have an overview and can learn in big chunks and may get bored if you're having a lot of sequence in your learning. Reflective learners. Those may be misinterpreted in your group because they may need to think about a question and they may prefer to think alone before they can answer that question. So we may misinterpret their disengagement. And the active learner. Those may need to learn in groups, they may prefer social settings, they may prefer activities. So imagine if you're in a session and you are not having your learning style met. It may be very difficult to understand, it may be difficult to stay focused. So I invite you to think back to a time for yourself when you were really engaged in your education. What was happening? Um, this could give you a clue to what kind of style you actually prefer. Ultimately, there are many different styles, and even more than I've listed here. The more variety of learning methods we include in our prenatal education sessions, the more engaged our participants will be. And I actually really encourage you, if you're interested in learning about your specific and preferred learning style, there's a free quiz that you can take. It's called the Index of Learning Styles Questionnaire from North Carolina State University. And we've added this link to our resource list. And I'm going to have Jenny now share with you an activity that she's done. And it incorporates a lot of the learning styles. And she's found it's worked really well with her prenatal session. OK, great. So. Um we're going to start, actually, by um, looking at a best start key message. So Louise referred or showed you how to access these key messages earlier in the webinar. 
So the key message I'm looking at today is a healthy, balanced diet will help provide the nutrients you and your baby need during pregnancy and after birth. So a big piece of this um, is really, or what's an important piece of this is around the vegetable and fruit consumption. We also know, like with the New Canada Food Guide, if any of you have had a look, that vegetable and fruit consumption is a, it's a big deal. We really want you to get more. But how do we facilitate a discussion around this? So this activity is a great way to introduce this topic. It's really easy. Um, you would just have to purchase a brown bag, something that you can't see through, so you can identify what's inside the bag, um, and then purchase a variety of vegetables and fruit. Uh, usually I aim for local in season fruits and vegetables. So you place each vegetable or fruit in a brown bag and you distribute them to your participants. And you ask them to tell you um, without looking at the vegetable and fruit, to tell you um, which vegetable and fruit they think they have based on their sense of smell or touch. Um, so they're using other senses and not sight. So it can be really fun in a small group situation. Um, so once they've guessed what vegetable or fruit they have in their bag, um, you can ask them now to share. So ask them some questions about it. So how would they prepare that vegetable or fruit? How would they eat it? Um, how is it grown? Um, is, it, is it grown differently in their country of origin or used differently in their country of origin? Or is it something that they like or dislike? Is it brand new to them? So this really can be done in a, a round uh, with a larger group, like in a small group discussion. Or you can kind of break your participants off into their own individual groups. So you can try the activity slightly differently, um, where you hand out the bag um, and you ask one participant to look inside and tell you um, and know what's inside of the bag. And then they'll have to describe it to the others in their group. Um, so they can't use the actual name of the fruit and vegetable, but they can describe it. So they can talk about its color, how it smells, how they cooked or prepared it, um, those types of things. And it creates a discussion around vegetables and fruit and, and prep. So if nutrition is not your thing and if um, you're doing a different um, topic altogether, you can still use this activity. Um, and a great example I can give you is um, if you're wanting to do a discussion around stress. So stress and pregnancy. So instead of placing food in each of these brown bags, you would try and place items or pictures of uh, things that the participants can do to help calm down. So it could be something like um, a CD or a photo that represents music or something that represents a bath or a shower, um, something representing something like walking or swimming, an activity like that, or a book to represent reading, or a gardening tool for gardening. Um, you get the idea. So this is an activity you can do here, uh, as I do with vegetables and fruit, or you can kind of adapt it and use it um, to teach or facilitate another conversation in prenatal education. Mm -hmm. Wow, that sounds like a great activity. Thanks, Jenny. Um, so going back to our poll, we had the second one being adult learners learn best when the content is relevant to them so they can apply it immediately. So thinking of ourselves as adults um, and it being relevant and practical, because we know adult learning is really quite selective. We are not sitting in a classroom and having to learn and memorize. Um, so we can really focus on learning what is meaningful. Sometimes we're not very inclined to learn something if we're not interested in it, or if we can't see any meaning and importance. So for most part, adult learning is very self-directed. Uh, and as adults, we do take responsibility for what is it that we need to know. Um, Malcolm Knowles defines self-directed learning as a process by which people identify their learning needs, they set goals, they choose how to learn, they gather materials, and they evaluate their progress. So how can we help our clients with that? I think one of the things is recognizing that adults often have a problem-centered approach to learning. So they're interested in the content that has a direct application to their lives. And they want to see immediately how is this content relevant to them and their current problems or situations. I found that the best learning environment is really one that provides a personal relevance in, um, in what a participant learns. So, so we, as the educator facilitators, have to be really aware of what are their learning needs. And 
thinking about this in participation in actually setting some learning outcomes based on whatever their real world needs. So for this, we need to know what are our clients' individual goals. So it takes time, obviously, to get to know our individual clients for this kind of work to be done in a way that is meaningful to our clients. But we know there is plenty of prenatal and preconception information available everywhere. We know it's online, we know it's in print, through media, but can our participants really access this information? And do they know how to use this information to make decisions? Earlier we were talking about all the variety of participants that we could have coming to our prenatal education session. And often I find we are playing the role of interpreters and navigators of many complex, really complex health issues for our participants. With there being no actual single explanation around how an individual is going to really change their behavior. We may be really working with an individual for a very long time. And in our group setting, we know that through our role as facilitators, we're going to have plenty of opportunities to have an impact on their lives. So um, Jenny is going to be sharing with you another best start key message now. and an, making uh, information that we deliver in a relevant and practical way to our clients. Okay, so I'm going to refer to the same key message around healthy balanced diet. Um, so when we look at this message, one of our barriers um, that participants face when trying to achieve a healthy balanced diet is lack of finances and food insecurity. So a topic I'm often asked to do at programs is around food budgeting or eating well with less money. After doing this for many years, I know it's very clear that participants that attend our program, they're well, they have a lot of knowledge. They have a wealth of knowledge already about this subject. So rather than teach this, I really look at facilitating a discussion on what they already know. So um, the program I'm attending now here in Toronto, we get upwards of 50 participants to attend. Um, so rather than do it as a large group, I separate everyone into smaller groups with some flip chart paper and markers and really ask them to kind of brainstorm together. What are some of the things that they're doing um, to really eat well um, and not spend as much money? So it's really great to see what participants come up with and to watch to see how participants can actually go home with new ideas and new information that they've learned from each other. Um, one of the things that's come out recently, so I've been doing this for many years, um, is uh, the idea we've been sharing when we do this small group discussion is really around the use of grocery apps to price match. Um, so this includes explaining sort of what price matching is, that it can be done using flyers or applications. Um, I also explain uh, another thing that comes out often is um, in addition to using uh, doing price matching and using apps, is uh, that they can use um, the apps to um, also get additional savings, so like rebates and coupons, or use a point system. Um, the other thing that we sometimes comes comes out that um, through these things is looking at unit cost. So looking at price comparing at stores um, and using that unit cost to do so. So ultimately, I hope uh, that I'm giving them some additional tools that they can use to implement some of the strategies they already know. Um, many of our participants, like I said earlier, are newcomers, so they aren't really aware um, of what grocery store policies are here in Canada. So price matching is a new it's a new policy for them and it's good for them to know. So it's a practical tool that they can um, take away and it'll help them to save a lot of time, so not having to go to some sort of store and a lot of money. So this small group discussion, it really can be done for any topic. Um, it's definitely a tool that myself and my colleagues use often at our group. Um, usually the participants will cover all the key messages that you have. Um, um, and then you just, your role really is just to kind of fill in um, anything that maybe you think that they may have missed that they might really want to know about that's very practical and relevant to them and they can really take back and implement in their lives. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, so. Does anyone else have an example of any activities they would like to share with us that they've done around relevant and practical ways of 
like something as quick and easy as an app. Anybody else want to share anything? Okay, so we're going to continue on. Uh, the next point that we had around adult learners and the fact that they do have existing knowledge, skills, and strengths. And in the meantime, as we continue, if you can think back of anything that you've used, it's an activity you'd like to share with the rest of us, uh, just give us some quick ideas. So bringing knowledge and experience. Adult learners also bring years of previous knowledge and experience. And they also have an established system of values and beliefs. So take a moment and think about how do we as educators how do we create that environment to tap into their information, their existing information, and also facilitating our participants in sharing. Earlier on when we had talked about what was a facilitator, some of you had mentioned the idea that we're helping clients to share their knowledge, so helping them to learn from each other. So we're going to be asking you to share your thoughts on this shortly as we move into group process. So for those of you that are reflective learners, we're giving you some time to think about this. As much as possible, we know we want to be empowering our clients to make their own health decisions. So this contributes to them having much more positive health outcomes, like a healthy birth weight baby. So knowledge and experience and helping them to learn from each other is important. But I want to share with you some information around what does an effective educator look like. And there are some characteristics that earlier I had mentioned around the importance of relationship with your participants. So there are really three main areas where adult learners have identified specific educator traits that they found beneficial to their learning. So these three areas are education competencies, relationships with students, and educator attitudes. So the first one, uh, we've already discussed it, like education competencies would include having relevant practical knowledge and providing relevant real-time information, and that it's practical to their lives, up-to-date, and evidence-based. For the second one, in forming relationships with their educators, adult learners have valued instructors who were approachable and available, valued and validated their lived experience. And with regard to the educators' attitudes, adult learners appreciated educators who were fun and enthusiastic and who listened to them and viewed having knowledge and didn't treat them like blank slates. Okay. Thank you. So I just want to recognize that it uh, looks like Public Health Kelowna just uh, provided a, an activity. It looks like they have Smart Mom prenatal text messaging program. It's free, easy to use, very relevant to clients. So that might be something that we'll want to look up or get more information from that health unit. Great idea. Okay. And Jenny, did you want to speak to your best start message for knowledge and experience? Yeah. So um, for this activity, so we're going to talk about knowledge and experience now with adult learners. So we're going to look at the Best Start key message around breastfeeding. So ask for help as you're learning to breastfeed. You can do this. So I know um, from my work that storytelling works really well to help build rapport and trust in a group. It also helps participants to tap into their own knowledge and life experiences. So why not ask members of your group those that want to contribute, to share a story about how they asked for help when learning to breastfeed. Or if they're new to this, first time parents with a baby on the way, ask them to share where they think they might go for help. This is really a great opportunity for your participants to learn from each other and share that list of resources that you already have in mind or in hand. Um, with that comes their stories about what happened when they reached out and asked for help. This really doesn't have to be a lengthy activity, but it's a great way to introduce the key message and the topic. Um, it's a great way also to pique interest and get your group interested in learning more about it. Um, I do want to mention too that it's really important that we give participants the option to opt out or simply share their names 
Um, it's really around creating a safe environment for them to share and for them to feel comfortable. And we're going to talk more about this uh, when we speak more on group access. Okay, great. So we're going to have another poll for you. We're starting to talk a little bit more about the group. And before that, we'd like you to take a look at these questions. So when I plan and facilitate the group, I, please choose the one that best fits. I greet and say hello to each participant. I listen and acknowledge differing thoughts and opinions. I work at building a rapport with participants in the group. Or it might be all of the above, which looks like it is the one you've mostly picked. So if you picked any of these, you're right. And of course, if you've picked D, you're also right. <laughs> so good job. The next slide is going to be a beginning of a discussion around our group process. OK, so let's look at group process. So how the group runs and the atmosphere you create at your sessions is so important to ensuring that participants feel engaged. So things like the first answer. Answer A, um, being greeted with a smile and a hello can be incredibly meaningful. It truly can be the difference between um, a participant deciding to return. Um, so when I say being greeted with a hello and a smile, that's you as a facilitator. That's also any of your other staff who are on site at your program. So it really should be in a complete welcoming environment. Um, so feeling welcome, creating a safe space for clients is critical to group process. So answers B and C, so looking at acknowledging different thoughts and opinions and really working to build rapport, they relate to creating a safe space. Sometimes the space you create is really the only opportunity your participant has to be heard. Um, it may be the only time in that day um, that they've even had an opportunity to share a thought or an opinion. So how do we do that? How do we make it safe? So um, making or setting a group agreement about how the group will work is a great way to begin to establish an atmosphere of trust and mutual respect. So ask participants, what do they need to agree on to make the group feel safe and comfortable for them? Ask what agreement or guidelines would allow them to feel comfortable to ask questions and share their experiences and concerns. So for example, it may be important for parents to know that what they say in the group will stay at the group. You can also start with an activity at the start of the group that allows participants to have fun. So for example, at a few of our groups here in Toronto, um, a, lot, a, lot, a number of our colleagues, the PHMs here, they'll go through a series of warm-up exercises with participants, very similar to like a gentle yoga. Um, you can also pose a group, uh, question to the group. So you can ask a question and have them discuss it with the person who's sitting beside them. Um, or you could do it in more of a small group, much like activity number three. So this really helps participants to get to know each other and experience being relaxed and comfortable before the larger group discussion begins. A relaxed and supportive tone can be carried into group discussions. So for example, acknowledging your feeling in a way that connects the parents' feelings or experiences. So this really shows that you're here to support and learn from one another. Even acknowledging that it can be exciting and also a little bit difficult to share with each other in a group is important. So focus on what the group has in common and helps to build on their commonalities and really relate to each other. To listen, acknowledge differing thoughts and opinions. It's really, it's your job um, to help participants feel comfortable enough to speak. So listen to what they say. Acknowledge their stories and experience, um, experiences, if they have value. So I'm going to ask you um, if you can share with us what are some of the things you do at your sessions that help participants to feel welcome, feel safe, feel empowered? Is there something that you're doing at your group that work really well that you'd like to share here? Um, so I'll give you guys some time because I know it takes a few minutes to type this uh, in to the chat box here. And then we can kind of um, come back, and then I can also reflect on some of the things I know that work here with our group.
So that's wonderful. We see multiple attendees are typing. So sometimes it's hard to even the use of silence, which we're working with right now. <laughs> So maybe um, as you guys are typing in here, oh, okay. Um, now we're getting our answers. That's great. great. <laughs> so um, yeah, so my groups enjoy doing hands-on activities like making rice socks or energy bites. They enjoy having something to take home, um, but it allows time for chatting, and that's one that they really like to get to know each other. Awesome, great. That's uh, Tiffany. Uh, Brittany is sharing an icebreaker. So asking clients to introduce themselves with their name, their support person's name, and something they're comfortable to share about their pregnancy. So about their gender, where they're new, et cetera. Yes. Um, yeah, so doing an icebreaker activity can be a really great welcome for the group. Uh, another one here. Uh, we offer an option of leaving questions in an anonymous gift bag to be answered at the following class. So this helps shy participants or people that are not comfortable mm, asking questions great in class idea. an opportunity to do so anonymously. Yes, excellent. As we were talking about before, yeah. we're all different types of learners, and there are definitely some participants who are not comfortable sharing in a group and do want to remain anonymous. Mm -hmm. So that's really great. Crafts are popular. Uh, yes, uh, perennial favorite is painting, painting baby onesies. Icebreakers, group norms, opportunity for one-to-one -one consultation with a nurse. Yeah, so we're going to speak to that as well, having some time um, um, to talk one-on-one. -on -one. Wonderful. Okay, so you guys can continue sharing on the chat. I'm just going to speak to a few things um, that um, really work in our groups as well around being, uh, ensuring that participants are welcome, safe, and empowered. So. Um, one of the key things is asking, we talked about asking participants about their learning goals. So a needs assessment is important. So finding out what their needs are, what their goals are, and then adapting that as their needs change. So don't be afraid to change or update a needs assessment or a goal setting if that's what the group is asking for. Really look at how you're speaking to your group. So really avoid jargon, big words. Um, medical terminology, if, it, if you need to use it, that's great, but if you don't have to use those big words, if there's other ways to say it, that would be um, better. Look at creating a safe and inviting space, so the actual atmosphere at your program, so looking at the room setup. So I know sometimes uh, having a table between you and your participants can sometimes be a barrier, so they may not feel like the space itself is as welcoming. Um, offer a snack or a meal if possible, so people really come together or relate around food and meals. It's a very informal way to do that. Um, build rapport by being a consistent presence at your program. So you're a familiar face, you welcome them when they come through the door, they get comfortable saying hello to you and speaking with you, and that really helps to build rapport and a safe environment that they feel like they can come and ask you questions. So someone mentioned about doing one on, allowing for one-on-one -on -one consultation with a nurse, so really being that consistent presence for them. Um, look at your body language. So um, what's your body language saying um, that may be different than what you're speaking to? Um, but also look at the body language around all of your other staff members who are attending the program. So building this safe environment, this warm environment, it be, goes beyond um, just you as a facilitator. Everyone who's at the program really needs to have the same uh, welcoming space. So I think we've talked about uh, not being judgmental, being open. Um, so also really important is giving your participants time to socialize. So building those social, social connections is really critical. There's no reason why you have to fill the entire time of your program. So allow for time for both facilitation and social time. This is also 
really important time, um, again, so that they can come and ask you questions one-on-one. -on -one. Um, they may not feel comfortable asking you in a group. Um, something else that, that's worked well in some of our programs here, um, it, you may, it may work for your program depending on your group needs, is to try to start the class off with a calming exercise. So doing something like a sitting meditation, a five-minute meditation that the room goes quiet and it really centers the group. And then you can reconnect around a, a, a larger facilitation event. Um, and most importantly, ask them how it's working. So get their feedback on the group agreement, on the group norms that you set at the beginning. Find out if there's any adjustments that need to be made. So is there anything that hasn't been working that they'd like to relook at and change? Great, and we've had some feedback from some others. So thank you for those that are continuing to give us some activities. So we have begin also with getting to know each other and possible finding some common ground with someone else in the group. Absolutely. Then you're helping to build those connections, right? Decreasing that isolation we were discussing earlier. Um, sometimes this will make others feel more comfortable about sharing more freely. Yes. Um, and lastly, we also have I cook with the participants and have lots of healthy snacks. That sounds great. Yeah. Really good idea. <laughs> and I know as a dietitian, many of my colleagues will say that the, doing some food skills or doing some cooking with participants is a really great way to um, build that rapport. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to move on. Um, so we're going to take a moment now um, to reflect on the questions from the initial poll that we asked you at the start of today's webinar. So we know that we've discussed many of these things um, from the poll already, and you may or may not have a different view, uh, but Trish is going to review each question with you, um, sharing and reflecting on her experiences as a trainer and as a coach. Um, so we're going to go back through the poll, um, and we'll look at each question. Great. Excellent. So we saw that the majority of you are, over 70% of you are not feeling that you need to have any of these actions in your prenatal education session or not feeling responsible to follow through with any of these. But then there are some of you that are also feeling that you do need to. So it merits a bit of a discussion. And as we're going through this, the way we are engaging is through our chat line. So we'd love to hear your feedback on this. So the first one, I'm going to read it out and give you some thoughts. And as you have the open chat line, please add anything else that you feel would be helpful. So with feeling that you have to answer every question that's being asked during a session, um, and that could be difficult in two areas. So it can be quite stressful for you as a facilitator, educator, feeling like, oh my goodness, I have to know so much information and I have to be able to answer it all. So not being afraid to say I don't know, not being afraid to say I'll get back to you. And what I'd like to open up to you is we know there's a variety of methods that you can still be comfortable with to give the information to the client, whether it's later on, one-on-one -on -one during that session, or using the parking lot for a question and being able to come up with it later for the group. But we invite you, if you have other methods to share, um, please do let us know. Because we don't want to be imposing that kind of stress on ourselves for A, having to know everything. We can't possibly know everything all the time, and information is always changing. And B, also the group dynamics. So earlier on when Jenny was talking about the group process. Imagine that you're answering all the questions for everybody. So what is happening then to the rest of the group? You may not be engaging all the participants, especially if it's a set group of parents that are always coming up with questions and feeling like they need to have the answers to. So think about the group engagement and also be thinking about yourself and how can you then work with keeping that momentum going, keeping the group process going, and having a way and a method that you let the participants know that their question is valued, but you will get back to them. Jenny, are we getting some other ideas come back? Okay. So 
If there's no more thoughts on point one, and also feel free that you can always come back to give us any more information that you'd like to on any of the points we're reviewing. I feel I need to follow my session plan as written. So a very low amount, a percentage of only 2.3 here. So this is great because when we do, sometimes I, I feel, are we making assumptions about what their learning needs are? So being flexible to suit the needs and the interests of the group sometimes will mean you're going to go off topic. And actually, as a facilitator, take this as a good sign. It may mean that the parents have actually found something they really want to discuss and that your session is actually going really well. So pay attention to what's happening in your group. If, if you're seeing parents and participants looking restless, looking bored, there's a reason. And so take a moment actually to stop what you're doing. And you may be comfortable commenting on what you're noticing. You may be able to say something like, oh, I see that some of you are not as interested in the information I give. I'm giving. Is it possible to check in with you? Is there something else you'd rather talk about? Sometimes just naming it and saying it will be helpful for the entire group than just running through whatever it is that you have as a session plan. Or perhaps parents aren't clear about what's being discussed or what your expectations are of them. Sometimes it's as simple as maybe changing up the pace, sometimes giving a break, uh, perhaps parents aren't happy with the way things are going in the group, but I find that clarity and asking them what they would like to do is really good because when you're an open and transparent facilitator and educator, parents will feel comfortable to approach you and they will know that it's, it's that kind of environment where you're opening up information. So you can do this also if you're finding that the discussion is lacking direction or it's rambling. Basically, it may be that what you're talking about is not a priority to that particular parent or group. So having the ability to change on the spot. And flexibility was something you had mentioned earlier. So the last one, oh, sorry, the third one, C, I feel I'm responsible for participants not returning. So there are so many reasons why participants don't return. Um, many times, the other stresses in their lives are taking priority, and if you have the means and the resources to try to reduce some of these barriers, you're already providing, hopefully, uh, transportation reimbursement, childcare, perhaps interpretation. That can really help with your numbers. Um, but reflect back on what we discussed in group process, and if you've done everything you can to ensure a safe and welcoming group atmosphere, there is likely something beyond your control keeping participants from being able to attend. And the last point we had is, I feel as the educator I have the better answer. Uh, with this, sometimes we are making assumptions. Are we assuming that the participants don't know or that your answer is better or perhaps that they are misinformed? or that traditional or cultural practices are wrong. So in my experience, practices change as evidence and research changes. So before we say not to do something, it's important to give clients a voice to share. And it's really how, how are we delivering our best practice message is key. Are we being sensitive to our clients in our delivery? And if there's no immediate uh, harm, giving clients a voice to share is really important. And Jenny is going to give you an example of what we mean by this. Thank you. So um, I have this issue come up often when I'm talking about, um, or a question gets asked often actually when I'm talking about breastfeeding and nutrition. So I'm asked if there's any something that they can eat or drink that will increase breast milk supply. So working for public health, my answer really around that is no, there's nothing um, in particular that you can eat or drink that will increase your breast milk supply. It's really about having baby at your breast to increase supply. But at the program that I work at here in Toronto, we're multi-partners. So we have a lot of different agencies, lots of different staff coming in. Um, uh, at, at this particular program, we have a lactation consultant and a midwife, and their views on that are different than my own. So they may say to participants um, uh, that there are some foods that they can try to increase supply. 
So my role isn't to discredit those other practitioners, um, but rather to acknowledge that they have a different point of view. And so I often say to the participants in this situation, I'll say, if there's no immediate harm in eating the food, so often the one that comes up is oats and oatmeal, like around making a lactation cookie, um, and there could be a potential benefit, then you can try, right? So I'm not discrediting my agency's, um, like our messaging here, and I'm not discrediting the other um, care professionals. Thank you, those are great. Okay, so I think we'll um, go back to our presentation. And we're going to move towards some additional tips. Yeah, so just moving to the poll now. So just some last, some last thoughts to consider. I have a number of things to kind of go through here. Um, so I've given you some examples of activities that have worked well to integrate the principles we've been talking about today. So really looking at, I mentioned a fun activity that can integrate um, participants' different learning styles. I mentioned an activity that taps into and builds on the knowledge they already know, so around food budgeting. And I also mentioned using storytelling to build rapport um, and allow for group discussion. But there's some other things that to consider um, that can actually influence engaged kids here this week. So the first thing I want to mention is don't panic if things don't go the way you envisioned. So really learn from that experience. So go back, ask your participants what they liked or what they'd like to see done differently. If, um, if you see or hear that your group's interests have changed, redo the group's needs assessment. So find out what they'd like to learn about now. Um, this can be especially true if there's been recent news coverage on, the, on an issue. So I know, for example, when Zika virus hit the news, um, it sort of caught national attention. A lot of our participants came back and said that's what they wanted to know more about. So they wanted to know what are the risks, how do, how do I protect myself, how do I protect my baby. Um, and years before that, there was a lot of news coverage around uh, mercury and fish. And so we suddenly got um, a lot of questions around how do I protect myself and what Am I eating the right foods? Am I choosing the right fish for my family? So kind of adapting that new assessment as you need to. Um, an important point is don't worry about filling the time in your group. Uh, plan a couple of different activities. So maybe a short intro, like many mentioned, or an icebreaker. Um, and then a longer facilitation activity. Um, as Trish was mentioning earlier, um, silence is not a bad thing. So if you... Um, if the room goes silent, don't feel like you need to jump in um, and speak when, when it's silent. So ask a question, uh, wait for your participants to answer. They could need some time to think and even just some time to be brave enough to answer the question. Something else to consider. So I talked about a fun activity and games, games can be very fun in a group. Um, but be aware of how, how to use them or how best to use them. So Jeopardy is one that I see often. It's a, like a Jeopardy-like quiz game. Um, but um, it can feel like a question and answer period. So there's, and it can be really directive around a right or wrong answer. So um, think about if, a, if the game is really a best fit for your group, especially if you have multiple literacy levels or different cultural differences. Um, don't insist, I mentioned this one earlier, don't insist that everyone participate. Um, we talked about different learning styles. So some participants would rather sit back and listen and reflect and um, reflect on what's being said than actively engage in the group. So I often find that there are participants that will approach me after, um, speak one-on-one -on -one with me for clarification or ask their follow-up questions. And that's okay because that's what's working for them and that's how they feel safe. Another important thing is to look at um, recognizing the strengths of your participants. So I was once asked how to engage a participant who comes to our program, who comes to CPMG regularly, but she refuses to speak at the group and she refuses to socialize. So my answer was, um, she, my answer is basically she's coming to your group. She has a need, she's identified the need, and she's coming to the group because it helps 
it helps with her need, it helps to fulfill that need. So that's really her strength. So if she's ready and wanting to engage in a different way, she will try. Um, and your role is really to support her in this, to build on her strength. In a private conversation with her, you could ask her, um, you could tell her thank you for coming out, ask her if there's anything you can do differently or better to help support her while she's there. Does she have a learning need? So, and recognize that she may say no, and that's okay too. So another point around guest facilitators and presenters. Um, so having somebody new come to your group um, can really help with engagement. Um, usually participants are pretty happy to hear from a member of the community that might be a trusted knowledge source. So in our groups, we usually have like a midwife come out or a settlement worker, a social worker. Um, sometimes the need to bring in another facilitator can really help meet the needs of the group. This, however, can also have the opposite effect. So if the guest doesn't align with your group norms. So guests may present rather than facilitate an education session and participants may feel bored um, and disengaged. So think about who you're bringing into your group and try and match the information they have to share with the group process or group needs that you've established. So for example, I know um, some of the most successful guest appearances we've had in our group um, are um, a certified yoga instructor who really went through gentle pre and post uh, natal um, exercises or techniques, I should say. A social worker who spoke about abuse um, using stories and storytelling. Um, and a community agency staff who came in and did introduction of solids with part participants, um, but had them actually make the food and taste the food. On the flip side, another, another instance, um, we had an agency come to a program to speak about abuse. Unfortunately, the staff who came out came with a script um, and um, didn't really know how to facilitate the questions from the group around the group's own experiences with abuse. So the feedback we got about that guest was that the speaker felt very disingenuous. So be thoughtful about who you bring in. And the last thing I want to leave you with is to think about how you determine if a group program or workshop was successful. So did you ask for feedback from your participants? Um, and what does success look like for, for you? So for me, it's that participants are happy, like that they're free to ask questions, that they're able to laugh while at programs. I also feel like success, success sorry, <laughs> for me is when participants feel safe to approach me to clarify something or to get additional support. Or even better, I really like it when they come up and they give me their feedback. Um, it's really helpful for informing our sessions. That's great. Thank you so much for your additional tips. Um, we're just going to leave you now with a final thought. And it's really a quote from Benjamin Franklin. And it really speaks to what we shared today. So here it goes. Tell me and I forget. Teach me and I remember. Involve me and I will learn. So we want to say thank you. Uh, we've only just begun to talk about adult learning, facilitation, and group process skills. We have included some links related to learning styles that you may want to further explore. And now we're open to hearing uh, your questions now, if you have any. So thank you for participating, and please type in any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Uh, while people are typing their questions, I want to share something that I had a, a chat exchange with Tiffany Blight because she mentioned rice socks as, a, as an activity and I thought, I don't know what these are. So she told me what they are and I'd like to just share that while uh, anybody else is typing their comments or questions. So basically, they're magic bags, bags that are created by the participants. So she gives them long rice and socks, usually men's socks, so they're long, longer. And uh, she gives them lots of thread so that the, the rice doesn't come through. And they fill the sock up with rice, and then they, 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 they 
close the uh, the top, uh, and then the sauce can be heated until they're warm but not scalding hot, hot in the microwave, and then they can place them on achy areas of their body. So this is uh, just something else that can be done, and she says you can also use them cold if you want, and you could perhaps take them to uh, the delivery room if you want to, and you could add oils or lavender or smells if, depending on the policies of the, the birthing area for regarding scents, but I thought that was a good uh, little activity. So I'll go back to the, the main uh, chat room and we'll see if anybody else has uh, other comments or questions. To, uh, to put in. And I will show a couple more slides, so it's not quite over yet, but um, I don't think we're getting very many questions. Somebody's typing now. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just wait a little bit. But I, I do really want to thank the facilitators today, and I thought they did great role modeling on facilitation because they asked the participants for their own ideas because I'm sure within the audience there's years and years, there's probably uh, uh, centuries of of added uh, knowledge that uh, that can be shared. So I don't think we're getting too many questions. I I just want to go back to my uh, sharing pod just to make sure people are aware that we do have prenatal education modules that are available that you can download and use. So that's on the Best Start website, and I will resend the links after. But we've created PowerPoint slides that you're, you can use in PDF format with the notes on uh, 11 different general topics. And of course, there's subtopics within that that uh, you can use. And most of them, they were all revised within the last couple of years, and I'm very conscious they'll need to be revised again now with the new food guide, and uh, we'll make sure we, we, we get on that pretty soon. And if you're not aware of it, also we have the Ontario Prenatal Education Programs Directory, so Ontario Directory prenataleducation.ca, where if you do provide a prenatal education program, such as the CPNP type programs, or, or similar, or face-to-face -face or online, we encourage you to put it in the directory and then the members of the public can find your program so they can search uh, for pre prenatal education programs near them. First, we give them the choice if they want online or in person, and let's say they're in person, then they can decide what type of program they want, and I'll use my own postal code because I've already got it on there and uh, then they can see what's available in their area. And as you can see, I'm located in Huntsville and I've got a program near me and I can have the details on the program. So if you want to add a program, you use the tabs on the right or update a program if you notice there's something wrong with the program that you're delivering. So we do encourage you to, uh, to uh, provide your information. So I'll go back to the, the main screen now, back to the PowerPoint and I do see that there was a, a, a question there from Morgan Brooks from at Healthy Mother, Healthy Baby, if, uh, about having uh, cell phones being used by participants. What's the best way to address that within group? And I'm sure that would apply to colleges, universities, high schools, everywhere too. So would you have a suggestion for that, Jenny or uh, Trish? Yeah, I could answer that one. I think earlier on we did talk about the idea of group agreements and which you're able to make some agreements of how the group would like to have the anything that's happening in the group, the process around, you know, start time and leaving and, you know, what kinds of norms are we accepting? I think it's so good if you can have some transparency and actually having a discussion and getting their feedback on how they would like to use it. And then once the group is mainly agreed upon it because we know in this day and age people use their cell phones for contact and emergencies happen and we need to have them with us. So maybe the group will agree on, you know, having it on silent and stepping out of the room if you're going to be taking a call. But um, those are things that could be worked with through the group agreement. So I think it's a great idea to ask the group how they would like to handle it. And if anyone has any other suggestions, or Jenny, if you've had any other ways of using it. I was just saying, I was just thinking like that uh, it goes back to also you could uh, integrate it into your activity or facilitation. So um, like the 
the activity number two, is it number two for <laughs> that? Um, but just having them actually access information on there and use it uh, as part of the facilitation. So whether it's looking at an application or looking at something online, kind of making them aware. Because the other thing is, is giving them um, like credible sources to go to online to get that information. You're also helping them navigate, again, like what we were speaking to before. Okay, so, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so there's other ways, but I agree with group agreement. I think mm -hmm. it's so important. <laughs> Thank you for the stay warm. We hope wherever you guys are, yeah. you're finding a way to do that too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much to the presenters. Uh, and yes, stay warm, everybody. And by the way, I do want to acknowledge three of our staff who are uh, recent, uh, re recently arrived from France and are dealing with this nice weather that's happening in Toronto these days and are <laughs> a little bit in shock. Uh, so, and perhaps that's the case for everybody on, on the line, whether they've lived here all their life or not. Um, as I close this meeting, I think you should all get an evaluation link. Please fill out the evaluation. It's very important for ourselves and for our funder. And we will do a three-month follow-up. And this webinar was recorded. And in the next hour or two, I will send you the link to the webinar recording in case you want to share it with other staff. And I'll uh, produce the, I'll recreate the, the web links that were shared. So thank you very much to the presenters.